Thank you for this nice introduction and for the uh, invitation to give this talk. What I want to do today is to present um, the relationship between digitalization and sustainability transformation, and I want to argue that we need a digital reset. And this is based on a publication that just recently um, was published at the um, Ökom publisher just a month ago called Digital Reset, Redirecting Technologies for the Deep Sustainability Transformation. And the subtitle already says the key message that I want to bring about in this report, that we want to bring about in this report, is with a couple of authors, co-authors, um, and I also want to bring about today. So it's about redirecting technologies. And what, how can that look like, this redirection of technologies? Um, I want to explain that right now in the beginning with an example, which is video conferencing. Um, by now, we all know video conferencing. We probably all do it on a weekly, maybe even daily basis. But if you go only back a couple of years before the corona crisis, actually very few of us used technologies on a regular basis, uh, video conferences on a regular basis. Why was that the case? It was not the case because the technology was not available at that time, because Video conferencing was already technologically available in the early 2000s. Um, but what brought about actually using the technology was um, very strong public policies during the lockdowns. And of course, there were a lot of negative effects of these policies. But the example shows that you need strong policies to actually make use of certain digital technologies. And in the case of video conferencing, during the lockdowns, we saw that they can actually substitute for a lot of mobility. So from an environmental perspective, it makes sense to at least for some events, use video conferences instead of traveling somewhere, maybe even by plane. So this is one example of technologies need to go along with policies in order to make use of the potential that they have from a sustainability perspective. What I want to do in the next 30 minutes is um, argue first why digital, te digital technologies need to be redirected. And then second, and that will be the biggest part, um, show how digital technologies can be used in different sectors for deep sustainability transformations. And then third, look at the digital economy more narrowly, so big tech, etc., and how they can become sustainability oriented. And then finally, um, point out a couple of load stars or guiding stars for policy making, how they can change the direction of digital technologies. So the first part, why we need to redirect digital technologies. What I would argue and what we do in the report is that we need to keep the central, I would argue, sustainability ch challenges in our mind when we think about how to use digital technologies. And I just do this very shortly here. So we have multiple crises, environmental and social ones. We have growth orientation throughout the economy in the different sectors, uh, which is a core reason for different, in particular, environmental uh, problems. We have very much connected to that overconsumption in the global north. Um, we have a linear economy still that needs to be transformed into a circular economy, and we have environmental inequalities um, coming on top of existing social inequalities that we've seen in the world for, for many decades. So these are the sustainability challenges that I think helps to keep in mind. And what do we need in order to overcome this? And here I refer to um, um, research and literature under the umbrella term of digital transfer, uh, sorry, deep transformation. Um, which argues that we need a deep transformation. And um, the idea is that we now need a second deep transformation. And there was already a deep transformation, the, the first one, that was um, due to the Industrial Revolution. And this comparison shows very well, I would argue, the depth and um, the different dimensions of transformation that we need. So. You know, this includes not only technology, it, it includes a different way to do um, economics, a different way how politics work, a different uh, type of habits and behavior in the society, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what 
what I would say we need to have in mind this deep transformation when we talk about how to use digital technologies. Now, on top of these sustainability challenges, um, digitalization has over the last two, three, four decades um, brought about additional challenges. Um, and again, I will keep this very short. So we need the tendency towards monopolies in the digital economy even uh, stronger than in other parts of the economy. You know, big tech, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Facebook that's what I'm thinking about here. Um, then on top of these economic monopolies, we have additional power asymmetries, which is because of the concentration of information. These companies have um, control over so much information, data on, on basically everybody or most of the people um, in Europe, for example. So this brings about a, an additional power accumulation. The third one is polarization. So we see that due to digitalization, the polarization of income, but also of other social opportunities is increasing. The fourth one is surveillance. So this can be either by, by big companies or by governments, by states. And we see an appropriation of comments, which basically means that big tech uses infrastructures um, and highly educated people that are being paid for by the public. At the same time, they pay very little taxes. So these are the challenges, the digitalization challenges, the main ones, I would argue, that we, um, in addition, need to keep in mind. Looking now a bit deeper into the relation between digitalization and environmental sustainability, um, we see, based on by now quite, quite good um, empirical analyses, quantitative and qualitative wise, that digitalization is a double-edged sword regarding environmental sustainability. And that means that positive contributions don't come automatically. And this refers to how I experience the debate actually has been going on for at least 10 years. There is a lot of hope, a lot of promises in the political debate, in the public debate on the role of digitalization. There's this, I would even say rhetoric that digital technologies help the environment by increasing energy and resource efficiency, um, by, um, by enabling the way toward climate neutrality. And while, and I come to, back to that in a minute, there are a lot of potentials, I agree, when you look at the past, when you look at the last 10, 10 20, 30 years, um, digitalization has not really helped the environment. So the negative effects are at least as big as the positive ones. And the negative effects are in particular the energy and resource consumption that we need to produce all these nice devices and to use them. Um, and on top of that, we have rebound effects. So we have an ever increasing amount of these digital devices, but it's not only that, that the environmental footprint of the digital devices itself is growing, but we also use them in order to consume and produce more in the other fields, um, in the other sectors of the economy. And you will see that when I go into the sectors, um, how that works out. So regarding the sectors, how could then digital technologies, digitalization support the transformations that we need in these sectors? And I would say um, these are deep transformations. First, this is the overall logic for these sectors. So as I said, well, we are at the status quo at, at the moment, you see that on the left hand side, and we need a deep sustainability transformation over the coming years. And in the middle, you see the different sectors um, that I will um, go into in a, in a second. And on the bottom left, you see the challenges that I just pointed out. And here the point is that these challenges um, play a role in all the different sectors. And of course, it's always a bit different, but um, multiple crises affect all of the sectors and also the monopolies that we see that digitalization helps to initiate um, play a role in all of the sectors. And the same goes for, for all the other challenges, I would argue. Um, what we develop in the, in the book, in the report, Digital Reset, are a set of principles that you see on the on the right bottom of this slide. And these principles can guide us 
in thinking about how to transform and how to use digitalization to transform these different sectors. And these principles start by regenerative design. So this is, we need to design technologies, digital technology in a certain manner that they actually help um, sustainability purposes. And then there are, th there are three principles regarding environmental sustainability. So we need system innovations, not only incremental innovations. We need to make use of digitalization for sufficiency and circularity next to efficiency. So these are the environmental uh, principles. And then there are three ones that more look at the socioeconomic um, dimension. So we need sovereignty of individuals and firms over their data. We need to use digitalization for equity and for a resilient economy. So this very shortly, these are the principles um, that I have in mind when I talk about the different sectors, and you see the sectors here, agriculture, mobility, energy, industry, consumption, and buildings. So let me go into the different sectors. In agriculture, um, the main point here is that digital technologies can support a transformation towards locally adapted and ecological farming instead of um, being used to optimize high impact industrial monocultures. And on the right hand side here, you see um, basically that we have a strong market concentration in agriculture, in ag agricultural production, and digital technologies um, are being used by the big firms to, to even increase this market concentration. But it could be different. Um, but first, regarding the analysis, the point is really that digital technology is so far are being used to, as it says here, optimize this high impact industrial monocultures. So, and this is very much related to, to, the, um, to the concept of precision farming. So it makes everything a bit more efficient. It makes uh, crop production more efficient. It makes livestock production more efficient, um, but it doesn't change the system and it doesn't really um, change the big things that uh, that need to be altered in this uh, in a sustainability transformation in agriculture. So it doesn't um, bring about agricultural crop production that is locally adapted, and it doesn't bring about, for example, a very strong reduction in uh, animal stock that we would need from a sustainability perspective. And it, I would, but still, I would argue that it can be used for such what I call here locally adapted and ecological farming, but there's no money going into that. So what we see is that both governmental money, funding, but also, of course, the, the money by big firms um, all goes into the industrial monocultural production. And uh, there is basically no funding for, for this different type of, of digitalized um, agricultural production. Next one is mobility. And here the story is, is quite similar. So, so far, um, digitalization is used for, I would say, high tech automobile transform, uh, transportation. And it instead, it should be governed to advance a low carbon and in particular multi-modal mobility. So, when you look at where the money goes again and, and where the development is taking place, a lot of money goes to uh, driverless cars. Uh, self-driving cars and um, but then at the same time when you look at the concepts for sustainability transformation it's very clear that the individual car use has to be reduced um, to a large extent and that we have to switch to more public transport and that also we need to reduce the kilometers that we travel so this is where digitalization um, needs to um, may be made use of um, so, for example, you know, make public transport more attractive by having uh, good internet in public transport, by making it easy to um, to book um, to book tickets online, etc. Um, but also have um, have more use of video conferences to actually substitute for traveling, um, and have to, to have the regulation regarding firms regarding. Um, uh, travel regulation that actually brings about that, that people don't travel but use video conferences. So this is regarding mobility. Again, digitalization would have to be used very differently. 
an industry, an industrial production, digital te technologies can foster what I call here a resilient and circular production pattern instead of prolonging the growth dependent linear economies that we have at the moment. And here, um, there's a lot of research and actually also policy development going on regarding the circular economy. And I just want to give you uh, one, one slide here, where the idea is that in particular data, so that here, here it's about data, um, the type of digital technologies is really um, um, collecting and using and sharing data throughout the life cycle would enable a circular economy. So what does that mean? Um, we need to, in, in design, we are, um, already have to think about how to recycle and how to reuse the products. Then the data, how the products are being uh, produced, what materials are in there, and how they can be repaired and recycled, that needs to be shared then with, um, with people, so in usage base, so that actually individuals can repair products but also with other firms who make a business case, a business model out of repairing or recycling the products. So here data can, can play a very important role. So that, that's it regarding the circularity. But even if we make, even if we really, for example, in Europe, go very fast in this path towards circularity and in industrial production, that will not suffice to uh, stay within 1.5 degrees or to reduce the resource consumption to the extent that we need. So the other aspect that we need to talk about is growth dependence of these economies that we have at the moment. And then we actually leave this more technical debate and go into bigger debates on, on unemployment. How can we organize employment in, in a non-growing economy? How can we um, um, finance social security systems in non-growing economies and public expenditures. And um, there is little research going in there, but the research that is there shows that, yes, it is possible to organize these things in non-growing economies. And I think this probably nicely relates to the last talk um, that you had uh, yesterday. Um, but we need to, to have more research in this field in order to actually develop those concepts. Um, two more sectors. The next one is energy, and I will keep this one short because I think it's the most well known. So um, here, policy making should improve how digital technologies are used for distributed systems based on 100% renewables. I think that's clear. And um, yes, we we do need I think smart meters and other technologies to actually facilitate that, in particular for these distributed systems. Um, what maybe I can add is that. Um, while we need such dig digital devices for the transformation of the energy system, um, there is a lot of stuff being used, a lot of gadgets, in particular in smart homes. I know smart meters are part of smart homes, but then there are many, many uh, additional devices being used. Um, for example, uh, smart, smart key locks that you can open and close your door from anywhere. And these are actually quite energy intensive, in particular the production of all of these devices. And that countervails the positive effects of, of, of other more, more reasonable devices. And the last one is um, buildings. And here let me start um, with an analysis with, with I, which I find very enlightening. So when you look at the drivers for carbon emissions in the building sector, and here's data from 1990 to 2018, um, the carbon emissions in, in Europe declined by almost 30%, but um, the, the increase in square meters per person prevented a more substantial decline. And, and you can see that, um, and I now, go, I now go into the graph. Um, so um, 1990 is 100% is, is here, of, of emissions, and then you need to you see a reduction in, in these emissions by 33% due to decarbonization, so renewable energy being used in, in the building sector. Um, then we have another 34% reduction due to efficiency measures, so this is basically insulation. Um, then we have a slight increase in energy consumption um, in uh, greenhouse gas emissions due to um, population growth, 6%. 
And then this is the, the important aspect, I would say. We have an increase in the emissions of 32% due to the increased um, square meters per person. And so in the end, we have roughly 30% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, while without increasing the square meters per person, we would have had or we could have had um, around 60% reductions. So this is really, um, I think, in the analysis where we where we need to um, um, start thinking about how to reduce the emissions in the building sector. So here is my, my key message on buildings. Um, a new data culture that is being developed, I would say, can decrease the demand for new reconstruction. So this is relating to what I just said. It can reduce energy consumption in building operations, and I think this is this is what a lot of people are talking about and know. You know, smart heating, etc. So this is being done, and facilitate circularity in design and refurbishment. So this means, um, you know, um, designing how we build houses, how we refurbish houses, uh, in a manner to make use of sustainable materials, but also um, to build them in a manner that we can actually. Um, uh, recycle the materials then after the long lifespan of a house. But as I said, and again referring back to this graph, an interesting aspect is how to decrease demand for new construction. And this, and how this, I, I want to give you an example how this can be done. And it's very similar to the example that I gave in the beginning with the video conferences. So I would argue that um, digital technologies um, or data sharing can help to bring together people who have two large houses, two large apartments, and people who need more space. So that you actually know in your own neighborhood who might be interested to swap apartments, um, who has you know, a lot of space left because maybe children left the house, um, and who to bring these people together with people who, who need who need more space for whatever reason. Maybe they, they just got children or maybe they want to move together with uh, other people, however. Um, so this bringing about this information, that's where digitalization can help. But then, of course, you, you need a lot of other changes, other regulation in the housing, housing sector, but maybe even beyond in order to facilitate that. So one big problem is income inequality that we have at the moment. So that some people, you know, it's no problem to have a big apartment. Other people cannot afford it. Another problem are the rising uh, rents over the last um, years that makes it, you know, not attractive to actually move into a new apartment because your old contract is way better. So this again shows, yes, digital technologies can play a role. They have potential to bring about the change that we want to see, but only together with very strong other regulations um, in each of the sectors here in the building sector. Coming to the third part, how the digital economy can become sustainability oriented. And now I want to look at the digital economy more, more narrowly and want to highlight two things here. The first is on the ICT devices. So I already said producing, using all the smartphones, laptops, etc. Um, use, uh, needs a lot of energy and resources. And here on the right hand side, you see one prediction um, that um, electric, electricity consumption is likely to rise in the ICT sector over the next couple of years. The main point here is on the left hand side that we need to pursue sufficiency strategies next to efficiency strategies. Um, so efficiency has been going on and is going on um, there's the so-called so Kume's law that says that roughly every two years, um, energy efficiency in uh, processes, etc., um, double every double every uh, every two years. So efficiency is going on, but what we've seen in the past is that um, at the same time, this efficiency, these efficiencies allowed actually for new technologies that then are being produced and sold and the amount of smartphones and laptops, et cetera, has been increasing immensely over the past so that actually um, energy and resource consumption has increased over the past. Um, so we need sufficiency measures at the same time. We need to um, use our devices longer. We need to have less devices and we need to have that both 
um, as individuals, but also um, regarding firms. And this is a complex matter. Um, just to give you one example, you know, when you when you want to use your your, your phones longer, this means that they have be, to be constructed in a different manner. But it also means that the software development has to change so that actually you have updates for not only a couple of years, but maybe for uh, 10, 20, 30 years. This is how long devices could could last. The second aspect I want to highlight, and it's very much related to the one that I, that I just talked about, are the business models. So when you look at the business models of many of the big tech firms, they are very growth oriented and growth based. And this goes along with an increase in energy consumption. And I have to say this, this was surprising to me when I saw this for the first time. So um, you see here numbers for Alphabet, so Google and the company behind it and Meta, which is, which is related to Facebook. And you see with a dollar sign, you see the increase in revenues. And uh, with a flash sign, you see the increase in energy consumption. And what you basically see here is that, that both um, increase have increased over the past years more or less at the same speed. So why is that the case? I mean, we have all these energy efficiency increases. OK, revenues have been rising because these, um, these uh, companies are in, in, a, in, a, in a rising sector and are very, very much thriving. Um, but energy efficiency should have, you know, at least led to the aspect that um, that um, electricity stays, uh, stays stable or maybe declines. Why is that not the case? Due to the business models behind them. So these, these, uh, these firms earn their money with advertisements and mostly with advertisements. And how do you earn money with advertisements? By making people stay on your website or in your app as long as possible, because then people see the ads and maybe click on them. And how do they do that? Um, uh, well, yes, with with good um, uh, software and good algorithms, you know, so that Google search works well, but also with addictive designs that apps, you know, they are specifically very consciously designed to actually make people stay on there as long as possible. And these the software behind that but of course, also the fact that people then use their devices for a very long time leads to the fact that a lot of um, electricity is being used in this in this sector. So the business model is not sustainable from sustain from an environmental perspective. I would say also from a social perspective, um, because it's it's not good for individuals and society when people stay on on these apps for many hours a day. So we need to. We we order we organize these business models, and um, I would argue these growth oriented business models have to be controlled and eventually replaced by other business models. And I'm consciously talking about business models here because it could be the same businesses, um, but they have different business models, but um, probably also other businesses. And as I say here, controlled and replaced. So controlled means like with the Digital Markets Act that we saw last year in the EU and the Digital Services Act, these were big policy packages at the EU level to actually start controlling them. Um, but these um, have to be much stronger even. And at the same time, we need alternative actors that enter these, the sector or the market, if you will, um, uh, that actually are common good oriented and have you know, a different design for example, for social media that is not based on uh, selling advertisements. And here, I just want to point that out. In, in, an interesting aspect or an important aspect is that the public has to, the, the state has to play a role here because these, these actors, you need so much money to actually develop alternatives to Facebook, to Google, to, to Amazon, um, that it's, I, I cannot envision any other actor uh, that is not profit oriented to bring about the finances that are necessary here. OK, I finalized with a couple of load stars for a digital reset and um, focusing on, on, on policy makers making. And in the book, um, we have 10 load stars, but I just want to point out four here. So the first is 
um, that the purpose of digital digitalization needs to be subordinated to a deep sustainability transformation. So we need to think in the different sectors, I think I pointed that out, um, we need to um, think about the deep transformation first and the regulation that we need for that, and then digital technologies can play a positive role in this, but it has to be subordinated. The second one is the mission orientation in policy making. And this is debated at the EU level quite a lot, this, this mission orientation. Um, the idea is that uh, governments actually take a more active role compared to the neoliberal paradigm that we had in the last 30 years. Governments need to take an active role and to envision how technologies can look like in 10, 20 years and then initiate the research, the infrastructure, um, the education that is needed for that um, if we actually want to bring about the digital and sustainable technologies and market structures, et cetera, et cetera, um, that we need for, for the sustainability transformation in the next couple of years. You know, the time span is not that long. Um, I pointed this out. We need to think about not only efficiency, but on also sufficiency and circularity when it comes to digital technologies. And I want to stress again that the business models, I think, are really important that they have to be changed, in particular of the big tech companies, because these are the drivers of digitalization. And if they drive into a better, a good, a common good direction, that would um, help a lot. Thanks very much. This is the report again, and I'm looking forward to the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much.